Let's kick off with um, Susan. Do you want to put into context the discussion we're going to have tonight? Yes, thanks. Um, so picking up from what Dean was saying, I think you know there are many factors that determine um, whether an issue becomes political. Uh, for me, when it comes to housing, two particular things stand out. The first is voter aspiration, and the other is visibility. So. I think the recent uh, results of the general election emphasise that there's quite a lot of dissatisfaction among younger voters. Uh, many of you would have seen the recent YouGov poll that showed just 4% of 18 to 24 year olds trust the Conservatives to deal with housing. That compares with 44 for Labour. So there's a big issue there. And it's not surprising, really, when you consider that house prices are now almost eight, eight, eight times um, average earnings in England and Wales. And we have a whole generation struggling to get on the housing ladder. So if you want to buy in London, for example, you have to save more than £70,000 for a deposit. And that's, you know, all the while you're paying quite high rents. So it's, it's very difficult. And we do have a whole generation who feel excluded and disenfranchised. And then right after the general election, we had Grenfell, right? And that horrendous event, I think, shocked us all. But it did more than that. You know, it happened in a borough where house price to earnings ratio is over 38 times. So, you know, that's, that's the most difficult place to, to, to buy a home if you're a struggling first-time buyer. And what it did is it served to highlight the very real inequalities that exist in housing today. It's given much more visibility to the sense of injustice and exclusion felt by many communities, not, not just in London, but you know, across the whole country. And that's not something that's going to go away. You know, so housing is going to be hard to avoid as a political subject. But while there's quite a lot of general consensus you know, that much more needs to be done, I'm sure everybody here agrees on that, the issue is exactly what and how. That is something we seldom seem to agree upon. So there is no single solution to the housing crisis. We've heard that before. <laughs> But here are some of my thoughts and some of the subjects that both Rick and I are going to be looking at over the coming year. So firstly, we need to get the numbers up. We need to increase house building. Um, the current target is 250,000 homes uh, a year. That's the official target. There are some commentators, some academics calling for 300,000 to deal with the backlog. And just to put that in context, that's an awful lot of housing. That is the equivalent of building a new Letchworth Garden City every single year. Sorry, 18 new Letchworth Garden Cities every single year. 20 if you look at the higher 300,000 target. So, you know, an awful lot of housing and a huge issue of where to put it. And that's where it starts to get really contentious. For me, the biggest um, test the, you know, the first test of the government's resolve on solving the housing crisis will come later this month when the DCLG publishes stats on how local authorities should calculate the need for housing. Essentially, that's a way of pushing local authorities to adopt more ambitious targets, more in line with market demand. But, it, you know, it's going to cause some controversy. It's not going to go down well in a leafier parts of the home counties. But, you know, as Dean mentioned, it's not just about the big numbers. Quality, design and style are also really crucial. And I think it's, you know, it's particularly important to think of beauty when you're trying to, to win the battle of public opinion for development, right? If developers want communities to welcome their plans, then they need to be building well-designed, real places and engage with locals and stick to the design specification that they've agreed. There is also tenure to think about. Yes, home ownership is important. I'm a homeowner, it's nice. 
and other people would agree with me. So, you know, the English Housing Survey shows that 59% of private renters expect to become homeowners, even now, even with, you know, the difficulties we are facing. More striking, I think, is that 27% of the families in social rent also share that aspiration. So we can't ignore that. But if we're really going to build more and hit those targets, then we must look beyond home ownership and reinvent the council house for the 21st century. And that means supporting a whole range of different sort of subsidised housing options, including shared ownership, discounted rents, um, you know, living rents, you know, the plethora of different products that are coming through at the moment, different designs, they need to be supported as well. But all these changes will require a really united effort from politicians of all political persuasions. You know, both Rick and I agree that the, the old political divides are no, lo no longer relevant. You know, it's, we're beyond the sort of right-leaning, market-led, demand-side measures versus the left-leaning state activism. We need a mix of both. And we need whatever vision comes from central government to permeate to grassroots. Local government must be willing to adopt more ambitious housing targets and acknowledge that the housing crisis doesn't end at their municipal borders. Yet neighbouring councils must work together. And they must also listen to a wider range of voices. They, you know, we need to go beyond the loud voices who turn up to planning consultations to object. We need to find a way of engaging the younger people who aren't really being represented in those debates. So collaboration is fundamental and we need to explore, as we explore these issues in greater depth, Rick and I want to find practical, pragmatic and non-partisan ways of dealing with the housing crisis. So it's really great to see a big range of opinion here tonight and we hope that you'll continue to join us in this debate. Great, thanks Susan. So let's kick off with um, contributions from each of the panellists, a few, few thoughts from each. John, I'm, I'm keen to start with you. Um, obviously you um, helped to write an ambitious uh, manifesto um, on housing. It called for um, a number of very striking things, it called for uh, a greater focus on style and design, it called for an expansion in council house building. What, in the current political climate, what do you think should be prioritised and would you have gone further given what's happened following uh, the debate that's happened following Grenfell and that, that terrible incident? Well, it, it, was a, it was an ambitious manifesto, and the white paper that came before it was, was pretty ambitious too, but Sajid produced it. Uh, and it was ambitious because it has to be ambitious, because of the scale of the problem. Um, and you know, just to, uh, I'll come back to that, but just to pick up you know, a couple of Susan's points, the, the statistics here uh, are really quite jaw-dropping. If you think that the housing inflation rate this year, 2017, uh, is about 5.6%. In an ordinary RPI, 2.5%-ish. Uh, private rental inflation since 2010 has been somewhere between 10 and 15% up. Um, now, house prices as a multiple of salary in the late 1970s were four and a half times. Uh, they're now 7.3 times. I think these are obviously averages and there's big uh, local variation within those. So we clearly have a big supply and demand imbalance. It's a, uh, a social problem, it's a political problem, it's an economic problem as well, because this prevents economic growth in parts of the country where we would rather see that growth spreading out. So these are all reasons for tackling it. There's an important intergenerational piece here, which uh, Susan also alluded to. And you know the evidence for that, uh, I think, is equally striking, that if you think the over 65s in the UK uh, today own uh, housing equity that is worth about 1.4 trillion pounds, that is about uh, 42, 43% of the total equity value of all housing in the UK. You know, it's colossal, and those, that is owned by pensioners. Now, how do younger people faced with that kind of inflation uh, prices and that kind of imbalance in ownership get their foot on the ladder? Well, uh, it's fairly straightforward for some young people because the bank of mum and dad 
uh, as it's called, can step in. And uh, this year it's likely to lend about six and a half billion pounds uh, to enable uh, young people to get on the ladder. That's, uh, that would fund about 75 billion pounds of purchases uh, and uh, account for about a quarter of the mortgage market. So this is enormous, but that is only open to a minority of people whose parents are fortunate enough to be able to, uh, to invest in that way. So we need to think about that. And uh, elderly housing is one of the things we need to think about. Uh, we only build about 2% of the houses that are built specifically for el older people who might want to right size, uh, to move locally and free up family accommodation uh, for younger people. We need to address that. That was part of the right paper. Now, if we turn then to uh, housing across different forms of tenure, uh, clearly there is the, uh, the build to sell model, the home ownership model. And here we have, for the last uh, decade, certainly promoted demand-side solutions ahead of supply-side solutions. So one can see absolutely the political rationale for things like that to buy. But ultimately, there is a risk that things like that push prices up further and cause people to have to stretch even further to, to, to meet deposits. It's the supply-side we need to do, and that's why we were quite insistent that uh, we want, uh, in the manifesto, that we want uh, a million more houses by 2020 and another 500,000 by the end of 2022. Now, I think that's achievable. Uh, it's got to be achievable uh, in, in qualitative terms as well as quantitative terms. Uh, it will require some planning changes, which were discussed in the white paper. And these, uh, for example, would speed up uh, the adoption of proper demand measurement. This is the National Objective Assessment of Need formula that mm. Susan mentioned, which will be controversial, but is important. It is also about uh, making sure that uh, planning commissions are actually used and used a bit faster than they are at the moment. The, I don't subscribe personally to the <coughs> very simplistic idea that, that, that builders are simply hoarding planning commissions and refusing to build. But we do have a building model in the, in the build to sell market that operates on a sort of build 12, sell, sell 12 type of model and doesn't roll out the housing faster than it can sell it. So uh, what can we do about that? Different forms of tenure, the private rental market uh, and indeed the sort of shared ownership markets do need further development. Uh, we need in, in that space, uh, I think, to, to push for things like discounted rents. You pay a market, 80% of the market rent. Uh, your landlord puts aside uh, the other 20%, if you like, as you, as you go forward, and then that builds up to a deposit. That, that sort of thing, shared ownership. It's not easy to do because you have to engage the mortgage industry rather better in that than it has been so far. Uh, but that's one of the solutions. There are all sorts of models like that uh, which can be uh, worked on further. We need to build uh, also better and faster on government land. And uh, this is about accelerated construction. The government uh, does need to make much better use of the considerable land holdings it has. I, I, I use government in the broad sense here. This is sort of public sector land, which sometimes is uh, it's underused, it's not all in the right place for housing, but uh, there is more that can be done and the government can pump prime in that process. We need to get more SME builders building into the market and there is a fund that they can go to uh, to have support uh, for doing that. That will diversify the market. We need to encourage alternative forms of construction. You know, this is the, the, the off-site construction, the modular approach, whatever uh, terminology you want to use, something that can accelerate the type of, uh, of, of rollout of, of houses and indeed bring the price down. Um, then we need to think in density terms uh, for our cities because cities are the drivers of economic growth. Uh, London is a far less dense city, for example, than Paris or New York. Uh, and den greater density, uh, sensitively and cleverly done, does not mean uh, worse living conditions for those who have to live in it. If we look, for example, at some of our council estates, uh, they are A, not very nice places to live in, and B, they're not very efficient in terms of density, so we can do much better uh, around those types of uh, issues. Social housing, uh, I think, uh, hugely important, and <coughs> even more so post Grenfell. Um, and what we need to do there, the immediate response to Grenfell is, of course, about you know, what are the materials used, what are the, uh, the fire prevention uh, systems that are installed, and all of that. There, there is a piece about governance have to be explored at some point. Uh, there is uh, equally um, a piece about who has a duty of care. And 
if you are a landlord of people in, in, in large vertical blocks, you arguably have a higher duty of care than if you're a landlord of a single house. This kind of thing uh, will emerge, I think, in the post, post transfer. But the biggest thing we need to do, in my opinion, in social housing, uh, is that uh, where the Thatcher government uh, very sensibly sold a lot of uh, council housing, it failed, unfortunately, to replace it with new social housing, and so we have a shortfall. What, what we now need to do is think of innovative ways to create more social and affordable housing, and we can do that. I think one of the ideas that was uh, alluded to in the manifesto, which is we build fixed-term social housing, we allow councils, we allow housing associations to build uh, housing which will be for social rent for a period of, let's say, 15 years, 20 years, one can run the economics uh, on this and, uh, and, uh, and figure that out in detail, but after that period, uh, the tenant has a right to buy. The money from the purchase is recycled into the next wave of, of, of social housing. Now, detail to be determined, but uh, this works in Germany, and detail will involve looking at how you deal with land value and all these types of things which, which builders are familiar with. But this could be a way to increase the numbers of social uh, properties uh, and also to ensure there's an incentive for quality because if the council is going to sell us at the end, it needs to be something that is sellable. It can't be a sort of second-rate uh, piece of work. So I think those are some of the things uh, that, we, that we need to think about. Uh, we need uh, particularly, I think, to get more specialist housing for older people. Uh, this is a really neglected thing. And when the care green paper comes later in the year, I think housing should be an important part of it. Uh, because uh, not only for housing supply reasons, but also uh, because you can prolong uh, a high quality of independent life by having housing that people find it easy to live in if they have some degree of, of dependence or, 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 or acuity. So I think those are uh, some of the important uh, things we need to do. Um, it's got to be ambitious, and it's my great hope that uh, despite the small parliamentary majority and despite the fact these uh, are sometimes tricky issues, particularly where you put the housing and the national assessment of need. Uh, despite all that, I hope it will be a priority for the government uh, as we go through this poll. Great, thanks John. Um, Terry, um, inevitably um, the chronic undersupply of homes over many um, decades has led to a real focus on how we increase supply and we've heard some of that from John. But clearly Grenfell also showed us that the housing crisis isn't just about building new homes. How, how do you think you get the right balance and at times, is government too focused on supply, or is that is it right that it should? Thanks, thanks, Rick. Um, yes, I mean it's been it's been an interesting um, six to nine months, hasn't it? Really, it's a, focusing, getting us to think about some fundamental questions. I mean, I think my view is that there is um, there is little doubt, and we know there's general consensus that we need to be building more homes, and there's lots of reasons why we do that. But I wonder what whether if we if we simply focus on numbers and we simply focus on supply, we are, we're actually avoiding asking ourselves more fundamental questions about housing policy. But I think supply is only part of the answer. So what are some of those questions? Well, the first thing, which is coming up again and again, and we've heard both Sir Susan and others talk about this, is affordability and access to the right kind of housing in the right places. And demographics are obviously important on that. And you can pull out lots of stats, and I'll say a little bit about the private rental sector in a moment, but there are some real issues about our aging society, and for people who know that. But it's also about housing's contribution to well-being and health, as well as economic growth and prosperity. So yes, it's about jobs and wages, we know that, and that's actually one of the issues, is the price of housing against wage, or lack of wage growth, wage stagnation. But it's also about our communities. And I guess a lot of the events that have happened over the summer, what's happened in North Kensington, is it is about what kind of places do we want to live in? What are we thinking about community cohesion and integration? And I think sometimes what, what has happened, and, and I think many of us have worked in housing for a very long time, we almost take for granted the central <coughs> role that housing has in wider social policy. And in, and in recent times, I feel like the value of the social in social housing has been lost. And I think part of that might be stemming from, we know during the economic downturn that in effect, the, the economic imperatives, austerity,
has really focused all of us, those of us working in the sector and, and more broadly, focusing on supply and economic recovery. And I just wonder whether perhaps our thinking's been a little bit too narrow and that we've fallen into a sort of what might have been right at the time of an economic recession and a downturn in actions that we need to, need to have taken. Are they the right things over the longer term? So I think just turning to a couple of those issues, I want to talk a bit about affordability because it's one of the things I'm most concerned about and I see almost everywhere in the country one way or another for different groups of people in terms of housing. And it varies, obviously, because of the housing markets. So there is, a strong, there is a strong argument that building more houses can help to address some of those issues that I've just said. But we also know that this is a long-term issue and we've had a long-term undersupply of houses. And we would need to build at least, I mean, some people say 250, some say 300,000, but the reality is we would need to build that number of homes over a sustained period of time to actually have an impact on affordability in the way that we want to. And we also know, as been mentioned, that focusing on numbers is not enough. We have got to be thinking about the right mix of property types to meet the needs of the changing population and a range of tenures, including truly affordable homes. And I'll bring us back to that again. Because even in the social sector, people are saying that the homes that they are building are not necessarily affordable in all parts of the country. So affordability to me is, is key. The second thing is that new homes, and this has been touched upon a bit, that new homes need to be of a high enough quality, not just to meet today's requirements, but are looking to the future. And people want to feel safe and secure safe and secure, and how we translate that into the kind of housing that we develop is really important. And therefore, I think one of the things we need to recognize that where we are now has taken decades in terms of undersupply. It is a long-term challenge. It is a long-term plan. We need to do something about it. But what are we going to do about affordability and access in the short term? There are some short-term gains and small steps that could make a real difference for example, developing a sustainable rent policy going forward, increasing council's capacity to build, and actually getting a grip on what does affordability mean in different bits of the country and in different markets. And just to give you one, I'm not throwing out a lot of stats, but, but we've been doing a lot of work, the Joseph Brown Tree Trust have been doing a lot of work looking at the private rented sector. And we know that there's been a huge shift in tenure where the private rented sector has doubled and of course, what's also happened is that housing costs in the private rented sector are pushing very many low-income households into poverty. And that we also know, some of the work of the Resolution Foundation said, something like a quarter of people that live in the private rented sector are spending over 50% of their income on their housing costs. That's not affordable. And so we've had a shift in tenure, and we've had a shift in tenure that has actually decreased affordability rather than increased affordability. And I couldn't agree more that we need a cross-party consensus on addressing affordability and access to housing. Now, some of the things we've argued for is that we do think there needs to be more investment in new affordable supply. The lowest level of new affordable homes were produced in 2015-16, 32,000 new affordable homes. That was the lowest level in many years. And only 6,550 of those homes were at social rent. So it's not going in the right direction. And we've done an analysis. If you look at the total investment that government puts into housing, it's really quite significant. It's over 50 billion pounds of investment. But only just about 20% goes into direct subsidy from the housing budget into affordable homes. So I think this is the time to, take, to just take a bit of a step back and think about government investment and really think about refocusing our investment to try to deliver as much affordable housing as we possibly can. And that needs to be with some flexibility to take into account different housing markets. I also think it's absolutely the right time to review welfare policies and the extent to which they actually support or get in the way of housing policies. And I think that one of the, the obvious examples is this government has prioritized reducing homelessness. I was at an event yesterday where the Prime Minister once again said, we've made a commitment, we want to eliminate rough sleeping, we want to really make an impact on this. But yet you have welfare policies that are actually having a huge impact 
and increasing homelessness in this country. Let's try to join up those policies. And then just turning to, obviously the fire at Grenfell was absolutely horrendous, awful. And I think if anything, for people working in the housing sector, you may have heard some people say this anyway, gosh, this could have happened to any of us. It's a real wake up call in terms of what we need to do. What is the role of social housing going forward? What should be our social housing policies? What are, what's the social impact of what we've been doing so far? And I've been having lots of discussions with people in the sector. There's obviously been questions raised about the state's role in housing provision, issues of quality and safety, and also I think really interestingly, the role of housing, as I said earlier, about community cohesion, inequality, and some of the broader things that I think many of us care about in this room. So I think we're in a position to rethink the role of social housing. Some of the questions that come up in the sector, how well do we understand our tenants? Who lives in social housing? Do we understand how many of those tenants are actually working and barely, barely getting by, and working two or three jobs and barely getting by? Do we understand that? Do we understand what they need in terms of the service? How do we define affordability going back to that? Are, we actually, are they actually affordable to those that need them? What is the value of the social and social housing? We're subsidizing social housing. What is the value of that social and social housing? What will social housing look like in 10 to 20 years? What would you like to see? Social housing has a huge role in trying to create strong communities. And I think inclusive growth in a way the private rented sector probably can't or wouldn't. And therefore, we have an opportunity to really think about those kind of issues. But we've predicted that we will have 250,000 fewer social rented homes by 2020 compared to 2012. So there are some real issues here about our investment, what that investment is delivering, yes supply, yes affordability, but also what's the value of investing in social housing. So I think those are big questions that we can't afford to ignore while solely focused on housing supply. Okay, great. Well, there are big questions, some of which we'll come back through in the discussion. I just want to touch um, Phil. Um, clearly, when there's um, um, too few homes being built, the house builders will come under the spotlight. And um, I think increasingly we're hearing criticism coming from some of the media, some, some politicians, of um, the role and um, behavior of some house builders. It, is it justified? Um, but it's obviously difficult to respond precisely to that without knowing the, the detail of the criticism. But if it's just a general house builders are rubbish and they're not helping the housing crisis, my answer is no. It's not just <laughs> and I'm going to give you three reasons why. One, we do loads of really good things like create jobs uh, and build affordable homes. Secondly, we build homes that people who want to buy their own home and live in them. We, we provide them a product, and that's really important because over 80% of this people in this country want to do that. We heard some stats from Susan. And the third reason is we get blamed for a load of stuff that isn't our fault. But before I look at those in turn, I've got to stress a couple of things. One, this is a house builder perspective. It is not the house builder perspective. House builders are not the same. And secondly, I'm an employee of Barrett. I'm not the CEO. And I'm not the board, so please, please bear that in mind. But from a Barrett perspective, we've grown our volume 55% in the last six years, and our output last year was at a nine-year high. And through that period, we've retained HBF five-star status throughout. And that's not a gimmick. That is 90% of your customers would recommend you to a friend. And we're actually really proud that we've kept that 90% rating at a time of such growth. And we're the only volume house builder I, I, I'm aware of. We've committed every single scheme will comply with Building 512, which is the Cave and Design Council yardstick for residential design excellence. Because Susan is absolutely right. We're not going to win this war unless we've got something, unless house builders have got something they're proud to take to local communities. And 95% of what we built last year didn't go to planning appeal. We're trying to do this by partnership, partnership with registered social landlords, partnership with councils, and it's fantastic to hear the emphasis on both those sectors stepping up and building more. 
But, but back to the criticisms, we do loads of good things. We supported 53,000 jobs last year, Barrett. Uh, we gave work to 12,000 UK businesses. We paid 652 million in tax, excluding the homes bonus. Created 3,000 school places, built 3,500 affordable homes, more than anyone else in the UK. Planted 617,000 trees and shrubs, and we gave 558 million to local communities in contributions. The second reason it's unfair is, as I say, we build a product for people who want to own their own home. Nick Bowles, an ex-housing and planning minister, said, no aspiration is more deeply embedded in the British psyche than the desire to own your own home. 80% plus in the people in this country want to own. I've been in the game 30 years. It's never changed. It's never going to change. There's research on the, from the CML that proves that. I think, we, I think it's just totally unfair and unacceptable. That as a council planning assistant, I bought a house within 18 months of starting work as a 23 year old with no support. And there's now a whole generation who has exactly that same aspiration but does not have the same opportunity. And housing policy, yes, it's about policies, it's about priorities, it's about balance, it's about creating well being, and it's about happiness. But if you want to create happiness, I think you've got to focus your policies and what will make people happy and what they want. Now, in 19, 2015, I spent virtually the whole blooming year trying to understand and then explain what the starter homes policy was. <laughs> Since then, the policy has been abandoned and starter homes are two of the dirtiest words in the housing sector in some circles. Now, I'm not calling for the resurrection of that 2015 policy. But what actually has happened in terms of policy development for that generation who want to be first-time buyers and currently can't afford it? I, what, is the, what is being done to help give that generation the same opportunities that people on this panel have? And the final reason why criticism is unfair is we, as I say, we get blamed for stuff that isn't right. We do not land back. We are, our business model is a fast asset turn business model. It's all about speed from land acquisition to selling the house. I'm not going to say any more. We do not land that. We get accused of not building 300,000 homes a year as a sector <laughs> like we did in the past. We only built 300,000 year homes either in the 1930s when there wasn't a planning system, but it isn't a planning system, or in the 60s and 70s when there was a huge wave of council house building. Now, I can't speak for councils, but I'm really pleased to see the emphasis on councils and RSL stepping up <coughs> on delivery. And some of the stats that Terry uh, gave are truly horrifying and they need to be addressed. I'm also not, as a planner, arguing for the abolition of the planning system. But we do need to look or, or re recognise that Greenbelt is a key factor in why the great cities in the UK are just not matching the housing growth with the jobs growth. <coughs> now, Greenbelt is the UK's biggest planning success story. I'm a huge, huge passionately proud of it and, and, and um, a supporter of it. But is it now time to look at 2, 3, 4% of the UK's Greenbelt critically, the worst bits? to try and address the housing crisis, whilst at the same time focusing and protecting the 97, 98% that will be protected and, and retained. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Phil, very robust. Um, Fraser, um, to what extent is the unaffordability of housing driving inequalities between generations? And do you think fixing the housing crisis is key to reaching the youth vote? Well, so, certainly. I mean, uh, my, my comment as Jeff Daly's monograph, Harry Decat, talks about a theory that every single conversation in politics can be traced back to housing at uh, the root. No matter what the frustrations are, it all, it all comes down to this. So there was a great political prize awaiting anybody in this room who can think of an answer to all of this. I'm sure you made appear instantly by the Prime Minister who's in need of some good ideas. Um, and this, you know, I, I, I 
also can't quite work out why nobody ever mentions QE in this. I mean, QE was a massive policy designed to increase asset prices. It did spectacularly succeeded. Asset prices now shot up, enriching those who had assets and putting them out of reach for those who don't. What did we expect? This was the exact intended purpose of a Bank of England policy. And yet every single discussion of a housing problem we have, nobody ever mentions this. It's like, um, you know, we had a magic wand that could take that away. We might have a little better affordability issues. If somebody can think of unwinding this in a safe way, things might be OK as well. But we ought to remember that we are basically cleaning up for the mess of this huge, hideous distortion in the economy and the asset allocation, which um, you know, it never gets mentioned in politics, but seems, whose effects seem to be all around. Um, but when it comes to inequality, I mean, a lot of, um, there's lots of exaggerations about this, but when you, this generation is better off in appearance by about 20% of income. But the one thing they can't um, match, of course, is the assets, because the parents of QE are able to buy a house a reasonable price. And also, you've got to put the migration factors, the population, house building, all of these various things which conspire to annoy people but in various degrees. The people who are most annoyed are the ones who tend to work about 500 meters radius of this place, who had a pretty good school, they went to a great university, they got a job far better than they expected. So where is their pad in Chelsea? It's not there. They've got to live in like somewhere way east of Hackney and they're not happy about it. So they are basically marching around Whitehall thinking, what is this? I've got like a one hour commute to work. I should be getting a cab from King's Road. So, you know, you get a lot of, um, you know, talk about how angry the generations are based primarily on the anger of Oxbridge people who still on 50k can't get a decent um, house. Uh, in other parts of the country, housing is more affordable, but, but no, you know, nobody's going to say affordability is not a massive issue here. Now, um, it's funny that on Grenfell, we can almost have a whole different debate here on, on, on Grenfell itself. I mean, the, you know, we all, everybody's got their theories of what went wrong. As far as I can work out, uh, Grenfell was the result of complexity. I think the lesson there is complexity kills. There were 60 different pro uh, companies involved in building that place. Nobody properly understood the uh, regulations. Uh, nobody really properly worked out that the flat flammable cladding had been sent there. Nobody rang the appropriate alarm bells. And, um, you know, this could happen again because there's something like 200 more buildings kitted out that way in this country. Um, and I can't again quite work out why it's taking my people so long to point the finger at this impenetrable planning and safety mechanism that's confused everybody, everybody involved in it, people on the writing about it. It is just Byzantine and nobody can get to the bottom of it. When you've got something like that, lives will be lost. If lives depend on regulations being clear and easy to understand, and nobody can understand them, but obviously for everybody who works in those houses, um, in danger. Um, now, you know, I'm not particularly persuaded by the lack of social housing. By the Eurostat figures, she would have got some of the highest levels in the EU. I think the problem here is a lack of private supply, and I don't blame Barrett, I don't blame the house builders. Profit seeking companies will build as many houses as they can. The problem is they tend not to get much permission because of our awful permission system, and basically, a broken land market and lots of political incentives not to create that permission. If anything, the political incentives are to deny permission. And so you've got councils who are basically given instructions to develop minimal levels of housing supply. There's no real sanctions for them in this review. They don't do it. There's pretty limited incentives. So you have got a system where you've got house builders itching to provide the houses people want, but you've got, again, an incredibly complicated planning system that refuses to grant the permission. So what do we do about this? I mean, I'm a political journalist, and I tell you, manifesto after manifesto promises to fix the housing crisis. It's like fixing the skills crisis. It's something people have been promising to fix for, for years now, and nobody ever does. Um, so given that my, um, my take, basically, is that the market is broken, I think the market, and I don't, I don't, I don't think that when I say the market is broken, I don't mean private companies are to blame here. The market is broken because government has got its hands on all of this, and government generally isn't working. So my solution is that government needs to remedy this by creating some massive big house building authority. Now, I know one is coming in any way in some form, but it would be quite good if there was a central authority which could overrule local planning commission. I could really see this as a national priority that would have the power of legislative authority to get rid of this impasse and to create the kind of supply 
that we need. Um, now that is something, you know, not many conservatives might think of this as, I don't know, conservatives in the Green Belt have got a complicated emotional relationship. And then again, the conservatives have got a real complicated relationship with the really majority of the House of Commons right now. And unless they manage to provide more houses, then Labour will win the next election. It seems pretty clear to me. I think the other thing about Kensington as well, it was, it, you know, it was a very rich Tory borough that fell to the Labour Party. You can kind of see the stars aligning here that the party that fails to fix the housing market will get voted out of power. So I think it's got to be pretty bold in creating, I don't know what you would call it, um, off house or something like that. That would just, you know, zap away planning and complaints. The next time you want to develop a burgling, you should just cap it without any whinging. And um, because until the until the basically whinging is extinguished, we're never going to be able to solve this problem and we can stay in forums like this for as long as we like. Great. Okay. Um, I'll ask a couple of follow-up questions and then we'll open it up to, um, to the audience. I just wanted to pick up maybe on Fraser's last point, which is, um, should the government be more hands-on or hands-off? We all agree that um, housing is a greater political priority, but what is the right balance between state activism and, and then just fixing the market and then allowing the market to respond? John, do you, do you think that... Um, the more activist approach which is being taken by this government and where political consensus seems to be going. Do you think that's widely shared across white or, or do you think there is there is still a belief that actually if we could just fix the market, we could fix the planning system, it will respond sufficiently to solve the crisis? Well, I, I think in the, my direct experience of this is a few months out of date now, but uh, my impression certainly was that uh, there is a broadening consensus about greater direct involvement, um, certainly large Parts of the government, I think, are fairly convinced by the idea of the accelerated instruction program, uh, and indeed by the idea of uh, allowing more building of affordable and social housing, partly by letting the housing associations get on with it, the bigger ones, they're very big companies now, uh, but also by giving responsible local authorities more uh, powers to do this. I mean, I just pick up on one thing that Fraser said, which particularly struck me, which is about the complex relationship. Conservative so leaning voters tend to have with, with green belt planning and, and housing and so on. And <clears throat> the object lesson for me was the last party conference when I watched from the balcony as Sajid Javid gave his speech about housing. And you could see a pretty kind of hostile looking, mainly middle aged audience, meaning their arms crossed and so on. And, and as he got going, then he started to drop them. Is this the only way I'm really going to get my children off the sofa and out of the house? Is by allowing something that I might have been rather more nippy ish about in the past. So I think that there's a change going on there which will help that as well. Great. And um, Terry, do you, do you, the point that was raised about um, QE and the inflation of uh, assets and John's point about the amount of money which is locked up by older households in, in the property market, do you think government needs to look at taxation more in terms of responding to that? Um. It's always, it's the one issue that has never really been addressed. I think many of us in the sector have raised issues before about the taxation system and the need to really take a, take a, take a step back because it, it does distort the market, there's no question about it. But it's one of those issues that's always been very difficult, I think, across government, particularly in terms of treasury policy to actually, as we know, taxation is, a, is, a, is, is actually quite, quite controversial, it's quite difficult to do. Um, what I do think is really interesting about what Fraser said with, with quantitative easing is that um, I think there was a time when, and, and this is always a bit of a danger, where one looks at housing policy in a bit of a silo and one doesn't actually think about the wider issues to do with the lending markets and the financial markets and whatever. And I do think that one of the lessons that came out of the 2008 crash was, a, uh, was actually a recognition that one had to take a much more fundamental look across the board including looking at demand side interventions with supply side. So I think that's a really interesting point, because I think you're right, we often try to find our solutions within housing, but actually some of the solutions are outside of housing. And I mean, I obviously mentioned welfare policy, but I also think some of these wider financial policies are, are spot on and really to look at. Right. John, would you agree? Um, <clears throat> yes, I mean, I, I absolutely uh, accept the argument that one of the side effects of QE you know, it, it may have cured the patient in an immediate sense in, in 2008, but there were side effects of one of the was inflating asset bonds. 
um, so it, it has uh, certainly certainly done that. I mean, one can reflect here really also about the dual purpose of housing for many people. I mean, at one level, it's somewhere to live and to, to raise a family and, and conduct your life. Uh, at another level, it is an incredibly tax-favoured form of savings or investment. Now, that has always been the case in the UK. That taps very deep into the UK psyche, and uh, you know, uh, that is true always of, of, of first properties. You know, the second property is, is treated differently, uh, which is quite right. But um, you know, do we should we encourage people to think of houses uh, as somewhere where they live their lives, or as somewhere where they put their money? And if we're thinking about the latter more than the former, then I suggest we're going probably down the wrong route. That's very hard to change people's thinking around this, but it impinges also on why are some properties built and why are some properties bought, which are then not lived in, for example, in London, uh, by overseas investors. Now, if you want a market to operate, you can argue that that is a market in operation, but it's not ideal in terms of housing outcome. Okay. Right, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Is there anyone who's got a question they want to ask? Brilliant. If you could give me your name um, and then ask anything you like, but keep it to a sentence if you can. I'll start with the gentleman there. Uh, Jeff Beacon, uh, Jeff Beacon from York Park Association. We're not sure it's planned. Uh, London's 50 people per hectare, the rest of the South East is under five. So it would be a lovely idea to have a housing authority that would allocate lots and lots of planning permissions, perhaps on the Plotman's uh, model. Uh, I grew up in Plotman's plot and the house is worth quite a lot, I don't live there anymore. But, uh, uh, so for a thousand pounds worth of agricultural land, plus a 20 to 30 grand uh, house from legal in general that they're going to be churning out in Leeds, people get really cheap housing. Um, and the, the trouble is if we cool the house about be too much, it would break the banks, but uh, I'll leave cleverer people than me to sort that out. And the thing we haven't talked talk about is climate change. Conventional housing has an enormous amount of embodied carbon uh, equal to our remaining carbon budget, certainly well over the one and a half degree one. So we ought to think about that as well and build with wood like legal and general do. Right, okay. I'm going to take a couple more because of um, time. Um, Robert, go for it. Uh, hi there, Robert Brandy from Savills. Um, uh, none of you have mentioned uh, anything about housing as infrastructure uh, and the impact on the economy. Um, uh, I, I think it's hard to argue against uh, the, the fact that we need decent housing for people to, to actually live in so that they can contribute to the economy. Um, and you know, I think we, we run the risk in London of the, eco of the economy being choked off because there isn't enough affordable housing. Uh, the second thing is we, we need to also think about the multiplier effect of house building. Uh, there are various people talk about all sorts of numbers, but the, it's kind of every pound spent maybe is three quid into the economy, um, or, or whatever multiplier you want to think of. I think we all agree that there is a multiplier effect. Um, of course, except if uh, the off-site manufacturer uh, happens in China, which would be quite interesting. Um, so I'd welcome any comments on housing as infrastructure. Okay, great. Uh, Judge McMahon. Ralph Fraser, Lubbock Parks. I'm one of the new builders desperate to build a house, housing. I've actually got two questions. Uh, one of them is, why are so few bungalows built in this country? They are by far the most popular housing. If you look across the age ranges between 60 and 70% of over 55s, 18% of all ages, and yet only 1,800 bungalows were built last year. Second reason, second question, in the US, 5% of the US population, only 20 million people, live in so-called prefabricated housing parks. Incredibly popular, many of them have waiting lists, the image of trailer parks is not the reality, and yet, you can't get mortgages on prefabricated housing, but it's very difficult to. We are desperate to spend money, build houses, and yet we increasingly come into difficulty with local councils. Okay, great. Um, I'll come out for some more questions in a moment. So, um, Phil, if, you, if we start in reverse order, should Barrett build more bungalows, um, and should they be prefabricated? 
Uh, if policy requires us to build bungalows, we'll build them. Um, in, as a market response to them, um, it's interesting to say we've got enough land. The, the problem is the land we have is incredibly uh, rationed in terms of how much you can actually build on. So without going into too much of the detail, bungalows are very inefficient in terms of how you use land to, to create floor space, floor space for your customer. So that would be my two responses. But if, if policy says we have to do 20% affordable housing on site, and half of that has to be on bungalows, we'll do it and we'll buy the land on that basis. Where do you find the most popular sort of housing? Bungalows sell, but they, we, we, they don't, they, they, they're not efficient in terms of the floor space you get per the amount of land you buy. Isn't that the amount of planning permission rather than the land? The land's got plenty of planning permission for sure, but exactly. If you've got a 20 acre hectare, I know such a problem would say they want first, but if it's not borrowed, I don't buy it often. On bungalows being efficient. Well, I'm happy to look at a, a, a model, but I, I, look, I look at development appraisals every day, and if you have another store, put floor space on for the same size of plot, <laughs> that is more efficient. <laughs> okay, okay, um, let's move on from bungalows. Um, the, um, uh, Fraser, can I ask, in, in relation to um, housing policy relative to other government policy, and in particular infrastructure, the industrial plan, do you, do you see it integrated sufficiently in, in, in across government policy? Or do you think it's still treated slightly in isolation? So could there be more to integrate it with the industrial plan with transport policy and so on? I know it's not particularly well integrated. And the, the problem is the government go through various you know, fashions and fits and starts. And uh, Greg Clark was never particularly interested in the supply problem for as I can work out. He does a little pet scheme of these rural and non-rural combined authorities. And um, Sasha Javid is more interested in changing the supply, but it's not as if they talked. To, I mean, the thing is, we all know the problem that lots of people need more houses. Now, whether they need them for, their, you know, to make them happy and more likely to go to Tory, where you need for economic development or infrastructure development, it doesn't really matter. And um, there is a question about London, actually, just how whether this capital is overheated and whether you ought to try to encourage developments in other cities that you, um, that, that especially in the north, that is a government policy. But to actually have this all joined up, I think is beyond the usual competence of most governments, but especially this one. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's go out for some more questions. Um, chap in the middle there with the blue shirt. Um, ben Tanzi, just private capacity. Um, we, we were talking earlier about the elder generation uh, in their homes owning the housing wealth, but also a lot of homes not being designed for them um, you know, for elderly care and living an independent lifestyle. And one of the, one of the reasons that have been put to me was that actually transfer uh, taxes and stamp are so high that for them to sell and downsize um, is just so punitive that they would rather live in a home that is bad for their happiness, um, keep the equity away from their children, um, and, 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 and also then you know, create this kind of affordability cycle. So I wondered, A, what are your thoughts on that, but B, more broadly, how do you feel about the stamp um, tax system that we have in place, and are there any other kinks or distortions that are caused apart from the one that I've just mentioned? Great, okay. A uh, couple of more questions. There's more hands than there are time. Um, I, 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 I'll take the chat there uh, with the time. You, yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry. Go for it. Uh, my name is Ian Craig, I'm from Belfast, where we have many crises, but not a housing shortage. Uh, I think the term housing crises, crisis, is a little hysteronic, frankly, in the London environment, in the first place. And also, I think because London is a premier global city and has been for at least 200 years, this is not fixable. It is manageable, and I think it's a mistake for the panel to approach it on the basis that you can fix a housing shortage in London. Karl Marx and Charles Dickens both complained about the high cost of renting in London, which was not last week. Thank you. <laughs> right. Okay, go on, as you got the mic. 
um, J.P. Florio. Mr. Barnes said something incredibly interesting, which nobody else pointed at. He said, in the 1930s, we built 300,000 houses, but then there was no planning system. According to the Institute of Economic Affairs, 35% of the cost of house building can be attributed to government regulation and to over-regulation. So, it is absolutely not a demand problem, it is a supply problem. The normal market function of where there is demand, the market will provide, will supply housing, that's being killed off because of the excessive regulation and excessive costs. For example, also through the rationing of land. And when Mr. Nelson says, and points at um, the um, demand, you know, the, the, the ever greater numbers of people who live in this country, there is no shortage of restaurants. There is no shortage of pubs or bars or cafes. Why is there a shortage of houses? And it is because government regulation has made the supply of houses very expensive or sometimes impossible through the planning system and through excessive regulation. Okay. Um, actually, keep passing the microphone down. A lady here, I just quite like to get your contribution. There's one, but if you come this way, I... Thank you. Um, my name's Steph from the Um I wonder if, as a couple of people, um, Terry, I think you alluded to, you know, policy needs to be more joined up. A lot of policy focuses on the deposit, the magic 10% or the 5% that we have to buy. But actually, should we be talking about wage stagnation? Um, and, you know, how financial policy should address that? Because even if you do manage to save 70,000 pounds in London or wherever, you're still not going to hit four and a half times your salary to actually get a mortgage. So is it a problem with the mortgage market and is it a problem with wage stagnation? Mm. Oh, really good question. Okay, let's kick off. Staff duty, John, uh, should the Chancellor prioritise reforming it? Well, the reforms that were put in place by the uh, previous Chancellor, uh, I think were quite a sensible step in terms of, of getting rid of some of these cliff edges. But it is undoubtedly true that transaction costs are very high, uh, and particularly at, at the more expensive end of the market. And this does impact, uh, I think the point that was made about uh, older people right-sizing, that are you really going to uh, take that very seriously as a concept of paying more of a £20,000 stamp duty bill or more? Uh, so I think that is a very good point, and I think we probably need to be selective about how we levy uh, stamp. Um, now, this of course takes, uh, takes one into the whole area about is, it, is the stamp duty, uh, which is a transactions tax, the right way to approach tax for property or should you be looking at the value of the asset overall? And that is a much bigger debate uh, and a highly politicised debate, but I think it is a debate uh, that, that, that is at least worth airing publicly because just to tax transactions seems a rather odd way to go about it when you're trying to get a market to work uh, more smoothly and faster. So definitely worth, uh, worth a look. Um, the other thing, of course, which is important for people right-sizing in old age, and this takes you to the bungalow argument again, uh, is that the evidence of surveys and so on seems to suggest that the old dream of going and living in a bungalow on the coast in North Devon uh, it's not quite as prevalent as it was. And what a lot of older people want to do is actually live in urban settings, quite often uh, not necessarily uh, on the ground floor, but where they are within walking distance of shops and the doctor and so on. And one can use technology much better to make that kind of living really uh, attractive for them rather than uh, bungalows in, in, in rural settings, which is not enough bungalow living, which I'm sure is very attractive. <laughs> okay, okay. Fraser, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, two points. Well, one about um, about wages. Yeah, they do need to rise completely, but you know, that's such a complicated issue. Uh, and when they do, house prices are likely to rise with you know. Until, I mean, interest rates is the big question. When they start going to about four or five percent for a mortgage, then you know, you might start to see some change. Um, I thought the point of Northern Ireland is, is really important actually because. And if I can do a little bit more London bashing for a while, right? we, um, well, we talk about the British housing market and British housing prices, but when you take out this crazy boom city out of the picture, it changes a lot. 
I've always thought, if I had my way, you would actually not have any national house price charts. You would have London and non-London, and then see the difference between them. And John White did this study a few days ago, showing that London is something like 37% overvalued to incomes. So heading for a fall, that sounds about right to me. It worked out all the other countries in the world, and the most affordable housing you can get in Portugal right now. But way cheaper than Portugal is Northern Ireland. You've got the cheapest um, houses in Europe you can now get in Northern Ireland. So here we are talking about a UK-wide problem, and it really isn't. We're looking, we're wrestling with this giant, this overheating, overpriced giant capital city of ours. And we've got people with very different needs and priorities in the other parts of the UK. So I think that's, um, you know, it, it would be difficult, it, wrong for central government to come up with a solution. That, I mean, the UK, it's true, but London has got the population density of like Hamlet's and Christmas Eve or something, right? This is a, a packed city. But it would be wrong to apply to Britain a solution aimed at London. Sure. Uh, yeah, again, I just I wanted to pick on the, uh, the, the great Belfast point. I mean, we can call it a housing crisis, but you know, if, if we see what the government's doing over in Houston, or, uh, what happened with Mad Cow disease, or the Torrey Canyon, that's a crisis response. That's not that's politicians responding to a crisis. What we have here is mayors standing for election on the basis of stopping housing, local councillors and MPs running for election. Never mind the national policy, elect me because I will stop housing. That doesn't feel like a political crisis response to a shortage of housing. And then on the point about um, the, 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 the regulation, I mean, I'm not a regulation expert, but it, it is interesting that for most of my career, I've been having everyone say, oh, we should be more like Europe, where everybody rents, it's a, it's a land of milk and honey, and this owner, owner occupation aspiration is growing. But actually, if you look at France, who now has a higher owner occupation rate than UK, ours is 63%, UK average is 70%. They've gone from 60% to 64%. In the same period, we've gone from 71% to 63%. And I just looked into that. They built 350,000 houses last year. Maybe that's worth looking at. Terry. Yeah, can I just pick up a couple of points? I think particularly, um, Fraser said he, we should have a, a new central authority, sort of housing authority of some sort. And I, I'd like to sort of question whether we really need a central authority. I think Robert's point about treating housing as infrastructure, and many of us have argued for a while that why isn't the Infrastructure Commission thinking about housing as well, and particularly when we are thinking about big settlements. Um, we've been working for I don't know how many years, 15 years, 20 years. We started with eco towns. We're not now talking about urban villages. We're talking. There's a lot of work going on, and there's a huge amount of capacity that can be released, including on public sector land. Some of you will know that the North Stowe site, for example, in Cambridgeshire, I think has been talked about, gosh, probably for 15 years or something. So there needs to be something that gets those kinds of things moving more quickly. It takes too long. And what, but what I would say is, because I'm always a bit skeptical about setting up another body, because you know that's expensive and it takes a long time, and it'll be years before it delivers anything. We do have a Homes and Communities Agency, which is actually looking like it's going to be more and more empowered to do some of these sorts of things. And I think the more that we can do to help to get that working, and indeed, the more we can do to get the Mayor of London and to all the powers, the more that we can use some of those mechanisms that have huge, huge potential. So I just like to say I think that's really important. And I would like to pick up the issue about legs, the wage stagnation. There is no doubt, if you look at what has happened to housing prices and wages over time, whatever sector you look at, whether it's the rented sector, or that is a significant problem. It's not an easy thing to solve, but in terms of joining up policies more and more on, at a local level, where they're looking at economic development, they're thinking, we've got to try to get this right with our housing policies. So I'm, I'm not certain how you do that at a national level, but I'm not certain you couldn't do quite a lot from the ground up, and I mean, there are some interesting developments in that front in certainly other parts of the country, but also it's a typical thing for any of the mayors that we have now elected to be focusing on. We have got to address that because for people that can't afford their housing, as I said earlier, they're just working two, three jobs, barely managing, 
And as we know, that was one of the issues during the election, is that group of people. Okay, we're very over on time, but if there's appetite, I'll take three more questions and then, and then in five minutes we'll, we'll give answers. Um, Nick, uh, if you... Very quick, thank you. Nick Jobling from Granger, a provider of uh, uh, private rented homes. I don't think there's been enough talk about this, certainly about the importance of its contribution. Uh, at the end of the day, affordability is about supply and demand, and it's about supply, stupid, and it, there's three types of housing. Yes, more affordable housing is needed. Yes, Phil's flat out with his other house builders building. But we need to also build covenanted, and that means it's for rent, and it can't be flipped into for sale, so that it doesn't compete with the for sale market and interfere. I don't think there's been enough talk about that, but that, the question I have and is that both Susan and Rick started by talking about the only way to deal with this is some form of consensus politics between the opposition and the government. Uh, and, and Fraser referred to the fact that if you don't sort this problem, you're not going to be in government. Does the opposition have any incentive to sit down and work? And is that suggestion that the opening of the debate by both of you a realistic prospect? And if so, how the hell do you start it? Great question. I'll take one more and then we will, and then we'll finish. Um, Chapman. James Gilder, Oxbridge graduate with no Chelsea pad, I'm afraid. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the category of people. <laughs> My question is about um, supply of uh, affordable housing, social housing. Given the uh, apparent lack of supply of such housing, is the right to buy still fair? Why should someone uh, without a house subsidise the, the purchase by the lucky few? Okay. Right, so if we take both of those questions and, and start with um, Susan, I think on right to buy, I think it's, do you support reform or end right to buy maybe? And then do you want to answer, uh, uh, do you want to answer this excellent question from Nick? Is it, is it hopeless to think there'll be a political consensus when it's so politically contentious? Oh, you saved the nice ones for me, but thank you. <laughs> um, on, on right to buy, well, it's clearly been a popular policy with those who, you know, who have bought. I think the real issue with right to buy is replacing the stock. Yes, and we haven't been doing that. I can't remember the stats off the top of my head, but I think it's, you know, one replacement for every eight sold or something like that. It's horrendous. So therefore, we're depleting social housing without replacing it. If we are going to continue with this policy, then we need to be replacing like for like, and that money can be used to incentivise new building, it can be used to help housing associations and council consolidate their assets and you know, manage uh, their assets more efficiently. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you do need to re you know, replenish the stock, otherwise it, it breaks down, it doesn't work. The other one was... Consensus. Is it achievable? I know, it's a tricky one. The thing I'd say to that, though, is that development, housing, all these things take a long time. So if the Labour Party wants to look good by the time it gets into power, it needs to start now. You know, so those, you know, they, they need to start looking ahead and planning ahead. So, you know, a bit like Sadiq, who's taking credit for a lot of the things that were set in place by the previous administration, you know, so there is an incentive there. I think the, you know, the incentive for both parties is that we, we need long, term solutions that you know last beyond political um uh, tenure and, and beyond economic cycles as well so that that's okay. the incentive okay fraser you said um labor would probably win the next election unless the conservatives sorted out uh, the housing crisis what incentive is there for them to support reform well given the choice between helping government sort the housing crisis and destroying the government, they'd go for the latter. I think that's how our, our politics works. I mean, in America, you might have across the aisle solutions. In Britain, there's a reason these guys are at two swords lengths apart from each other. They're, one is out to destroy the other. Um, I kind of prefer it that way. It's more bloody, but it's more interesting. But there is uh, absolutely no chance of any cross-party anything. Forget it. But that, the way it tends to work in Britain is that the government tends to steal policies from the opposition and claim them from their own, and that's what happens. So, um, and George Osborne, there wasn't a bad Labour policy in the steel, and, you know, when he was out there, and he got the, and even basically the huge stamp duty, um, which now made us the highest property tax country in the developed world, 
And it was basically an attempt to, to steal the idea for a mansion tax, and there you go. Now, at the last election, um, Labour, um, pri Labour plan was to get the Homes Communities Agency to overhaul it and to make it a kind of, uh, to give it the power to need to make it a new housing agency. But it doesn't sound entirely dissimilar to what I was suggesting earlier on. Now, I'm not going to say I'm stealing labour policy, but I think, you know, if common sense points to a direction, then usually the Conservatives will take it as an idea before Labour do. Corbyn himself seems more interested in sort of repossessing houses of Richmond and Kensington. I mean, that's kind of more his style of politics. But the more thoughtful Labour policy does seem to be around basically um, empowering central government. Now, empowering to do what? That's the big question. And again, I'd like to think that a conservative solution would trust the market and help the market and take government out of the way of the market to deliver these homes. That's before the asset bubble, of course, first. So then it's a whole different story. Phil. So. Um, well, I, as I said earlier, I tend to have my nose in development appraisals. So private rented sector and right to buy is probably a little bit off my uh, script. So OK, pass, pass the baton. John, political consensus. You said the planning reforms were going to be very contentious. I think the assessment of demand will be contentious, and that's not necessarily across the parties. I think that's just uh, uh, on, on the government side, perhaps. Um, I think political consensus uh, at Westminster level is really difficult because it is a game, as Fraser suggests, about theatrics and posturing and political advantage. I think where you can sometimes get what looks like greater pragmatism and sometimes even a little bit of consensus. It is at a local government level, at a city management level, and uh, certainly some of the things in my uh, previous life that I've, I've not had an attempt, but commercial life, I've worked on, uh, you have seen some of that around our cities. Um, just on uh, right to buy, it's absolutely right that the key is, is replacement. I think one of the things that uh, a leading edge think tank might want to think about is the right to a lifetime tenancy. Uh, if you're in social housing, should you uh, be able to stay in social housing for as long as you want, even if you don't need to? Or is that sitting on, on assets that could be better used for people who are more needy about it? Okay. Terry, by the way. Yes, thank you. Um, just on the right to buy, the only thing I would say, and I, I agree with what every, everyone has said already, it's been a very popular policy. Um, but there is there are two questions in my mind. One is, there's the whole replacement issue, but again, going back to where I started, it's not just about numbers, it's about where it is as well. And, um, and that can create quite significant issues in different parts of the country, depending on where you are. Um, so I just think we need to be, we need to recognize sometimes that what might seem to make sense as a central policy, when you actually look at how it plays out in different parts of the country, it doesn't exactly deliver what you think it's going to be delivering. So it's just a bit of caution on that one, um, which I think is very important to recognize. And you know, the th interesting thing, and, I, and, and I'm not as um, sort of in all of the political fights as many people are, but the thing that, I, that does strike me is there are some examples of cross, across the party consensus. And I suppose one of the examples for me is the Homelessness Reduction Act, which was an interesting one during the last parliament. I think in general, everything people have said is absolutely spot on. It's a bit of a game and it's very, very tough. But every once in a while, something comes through where people think, yes, we've, we've got to do something about it. And so there might be some aspects. I, 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 I still hope that we could do something around aging, because I do feel that we're not doing anywhere near enough in this country around the aging population. It's a demographic time bomb. There are things that government could do. It's that kind of thing. They're almost like, could we start to reach some consensus on policy changes that could have a real impact? Great. So on that note of optimism, can I thank you for your questions and can you thank, thank these guys uh, for their <laughs>